Good morning. So nice to see you and so nice to be in God's house on the first day of the week. And we call it God's house because this is the place we gather to worship. Not that it's the building itself is anything special, but wherever two or three are gathered in his name, where he is present, it is special. So we're thankful that you're here. I know we have some visitors today and we're thankful that you're with us as well. We are continuing verse by verse through what we read today and last Sunday at, uh, at the worship hour. We went through the first four verses of chapter 3. And may I remind you that Paul is, of course, writing this letter to the Corinthian church, a church in which he founded. And this church, though, is off track. And I am reminded that in the providence of God, that's a good thing for you and me because in them being off track, he gives them instruction that helps us to stay on track. Here we are, 2,000 plus years later, and we're receiving benefit from this precious letter that he wrote. Well, in getting them on track, and they were off track because of quarrels and divisions, among them, they were focused on people, not on God. He reminds them of who they are. He reminded them, for example, that God didn't choose the most attractive people in the world. He didn't choose the smartest and the wisest, the, the most blessed people, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I'd say that's a rather humbling thing to consider, for if you're in Christ today, it's not because you are something special, of yourself anyway, but because God was pleased in his sovereign grace to elect you, to give you ears to hear, to make you his adopted son. That's amazing. Not only that. He reminds them that salvation is of the Lord from A to Z. And he also reminds them in that process that the work of salvation is a transformation. And he classifies people in really to two categories. The natural man, the unsaved man that has not the word of God. And the reason he has not the word of God is because he has not the spirit of God because he points out that it is only the Spirit of God that can give you and me or anyone understanding that we might truly know God. And that's the huge dividing difference that there are among all peoples of the earth. Paul also reminded that when he came before them, he had no purpose in mind at all except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He didn't have his own agenda. And then in the last time we met in those first four, verse, four verses of chapter 3, he gave them a scathing rebuke. A scathing rebuke that said that even after I've been with you for 18 months, teaching you, I've been away from you now for a while, you're still acting like a natural man. You're still acting like the people of the world, the unsaved people. You're living and thinking like them. And so now he's going to go back and begin to address what he addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 11, verse 11 through 12, the divisions and the quarrels among them, where one was saying, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter or Cephas, so forth and so on. They were men following and taking their pride, their foolish, at least doing so, in man and not in God. And so that's where we are this morning as we begin in chapter 3 and verse 5. When we start this little category here of service to glorify God. So let me ask God's mercy as we look at his precious word together. So bow with me, please. Father, we come before you 
And our desire is to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. We know we have your precious word before us. The issue is not that we try to make this word appetizing to our flesh, but that, Father, that we understand what you would reveal to us that we might be pleasing to you. Feed us, Father, from your word. Help us to know the things that we need to know in order to fight the good fight of faith and live our life in a way that honors and glorifies your Son. Father, we ask you to forgive us, for we are yet foolish. We know we are. Work in our hearts and in our minds and lives. And if there are someone here today that knows you not, I pray you would intrude in their heart and mind and open their eyes and unstop their ears that they might know what is really important and relevant is having a relationship with you. Father, please bless our time together, not so that we in some way could be puffed up ourselves, but that we might be filled with you. Thank you for everyone here. Help them, Father, and use this time for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in case just the introduction hasn't done that for you, you know that God has an agenda. And that agenda is found in his precious and holy word. And we are privileged as the people of the living God to explore that agenda that we might get on board with him. But it's interesting that man also has his agenda. And it's going in an entirely separate direction, but some people try to put the two agendas together, and that never works. We are either on board with the Lord, or we're on board with the agenda of man that will never be on board with the Lord. Now, in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul talks out, uh, begins, excuse me, speaking and calling the people of God, he says, saints by calling. Saints by calling. Saints being those that are set apart, set apart unto him. And he uses that kind of a phrase throughout the epistles. But it's interesting, in the paper, I read the following. Vatican City. The late Pope John Paul II will be made a saint, the Vatican said on Friday, announcing that Pope Francis had approved a second miracle attributed to the Polish pontiff who led the Roman Catholic Church from 1978 to 2005. The Vatican said Pope John XIII, excuse me, 23rd, who reigned from 58 to 63 and called the Second Vatican Council, which enacted sweeping reforms to modernize the church, would also be made a saint. No dates for the canonization ceremonies were immediately given. Now, I know that in their theology, uh, ironically, they have just disregarded what the Bible says, and have established their idea of a saint being as some kind of a second-level Christian uh, and a special Christian in the church. And, and we see with that, and I'm not here to castigate uh, the Roman Catholic Church. They do enough of that for themselves, I think. But, you know, with all of this man focus that they have, and this is nothing but another example of man focus and man deification, you have the kissing of rings and the, the great garments and the great gatherings and all of the flair and all of the pageantry and all of the pomp and all of that which is supposed to be the attractive to the flesh and to people that they might gather around and honor people that are supposedly high up in the church and therefore right next to, to God, if not God themselves. But you know, all this business about honoring man, 
What does it do? It really usurps the glory that belongs to God alone. Jesus Christ came to do what? To seek and to save that which is lost. He didn't come to establish a big bunch of religious stuff that would glorify man and, and make a big hooey out of all of the religion that supposedly is found in the Bible. It's really twisted and turned every which way. It's said of the way that points to Christ alone. But let me just say that this idea of man-centered theology is in Protestant churches as well. Is that not so when we believe that man controls his own salvation? Is that not so that when we think that man can save himself or be a saint by his own doing? We don't need to call a Vatican Council. We just need to follow step one, two, three, four, and five, and God must look upon us with favor. Or we may think that in the Protestant churches, man can make himself a higher level Christian by his doing. And this too is a source of pride. In fact, uh, this article points out the man-centered focus of much Christianity, that is that man naturally wants to place himself and others up on a pedestal. And yet, who is able to make any person what they are before God? This is what Paul will be addressing here with these Corinthians that are putting teachers on a pedestal and placing them in a place of prominence that is shameful before God and directly in opposition to what a saint really is. And so Paul will, by reasoning, show these Corinthians their sinful behavior, and as he does that, it is a reminder to you and to me not only about this terrible inward focus that we have in the church today, but also this focus that we want to claim an idol like the people in Hollywood, like the People magazine wants to, that where we're trying to gather some kind of an idol that, it, that operates somehow or another between us and God when there is no in between us and God because God has made that way available. The veil of the temple was rent and we can come into the throne of grace and obtain mercy. And that's what we need. So, in our passage, Paul begins explaining here after he has giving, given a scathing rebuke in verse 5, what then is Apollos and what is Paul? Asking this question shows us that Paul is continuing to address the issue, again, of the quarrels that, where they have puffed up individuals and set them on pedestals. Sinful divisions, personality focus, man focus, rather than focus on Christ. In order to have personality quarrels, people must focus on elevating themselves, elevating someone else, and while we're in the process of elevating this person, we're actually despising someone else. Did you ever think about it in those terms? Here is individuals that are elevating Apollos and despising Paul, elevating Peter and even despising Christ because he talks about these divisions that are among them. And you say, how could this possibly be? When the Word of God speaks of a singular focus, and he will speak here about where their focus belongs on Christ alone and complete dependence upon him. And remind again the purpose of man 
is to glorify God, not to glorify himself or some other man or even some other creature. So what does he say in verse 5? He's going to deal with the fact that these are servants. He asks the question, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. The word servants is diaconal, and it's used of a busboy, in effect, a simple agent to serve God. We looked this morning, if you were here in the Sunday school hour in, in Isaiah 65, where the idea of servant in the Old Testament was applied to the elect of Israel, and it was applied over and over and over. And what is a servant? He's declaring himself and Apollos to be nothing but servants, a busboy, an agent of God. What did servants do? Servants performed the work of their master. They didn't perform their own thing. They didn't do their own thing. They weren't independently minded to go out and, and do their own thing like so many people seem to think today that they're able to do. But a servant is one who did his master's will. And as such, Paul, Apollos, and Peter are nothing more than agents to serve God. They are not agents in any manner championing rival schools of thought to bring and focus attention upon them. So that these Corinthians have promoted servants in their minds to masters. Now servants are are those who are assigned duties. And saints set apart, are set apart to Christ, are set apart servants. Paul calls himself a bond slave, a different word, but has a similar meaning of being a love slave to Jesus Christ. He didn't come like Christ didn't come to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. And as a saint, we are not here to do our own will, but the will of him who sent us, who called us and set us apart as saints. If you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 2 and what Paul says in this continuing dialogue. I think it is particularly important. He says in this case, moreover, it is required of Stewards, and that again is another form of the same concept, that we are stewards to do his will, servants, busboys, agents, to do his will, that one be found trustworthy. Word that is found in scripture that is often translated faithful. Faithful. You know, if you had in that day a servant that was a maverick and not doing what you required of them, well, they were in some dear, serious trouble. And I'm not exactly sure what the recipe for that would be, but it would be ugly. We, as stewards, as servants, as agents, as these Corinthians, Number one on our agenda is faithfulness, trustworthiness to God. That what he says, I follow, I do his will. And his will alone, no matter what it costs or what it takes. And those who are faithful trustworthy, are not to be put on a pedestal, not to be idolized, or take place of allegiance to God. What is that? It's idolatry. Isn't that the first commandment in the Decalogue? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If we are not faithful to him, if we somehow or another uh, get ourselves puffed up, if we get in the way of our obedience to him, or someone else gets in the way, if someone else, and we're putting on a pedestal, replaces our commitment, our servitude to Christ alone, 
Haven't we not made an idol, an, an idolatrous issue out of them? Now, I'm, I want you to recognize clearly that we are never to elevate a person other than Christ. By the way, his name is wonderful, isn't it? He's the only one, Isaiah 9. His name is wonderful. And that's not an exaggeration. That's a truism. But none of us have the name wonderful. If we do, it's pretty ridiculous. Because I hate to tell you, but you're not wonderful. I thought my wife was at times. And she comes pretty close, but she's not wonderful in that sense. Because none of us are. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look at verse 17. We're not to elevate individuals that preach and teach the precious word of God and bring us joy, I trust, from that and correct our lives and feed us from the word. But what are we to do? It says, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says that you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the labor, laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, I'm, I'm not up here uh, quoting this to get a raise, uh, by the way. Um, if you doubled my salary, it would still be the same as it is now, okay? <laughs> But what I am saying is that those that teach and preach the precious word of God are to be honored and appreciated, but they're not to be elevated. They're nothing but sinners saved by grace like anybody else. They're not perfect. I can assure you that is the case. Long way from it. They're growing in Christ just like you are. Don't elevate, but do appreciate. And uh, elevation uh, or, or appreciation, excuse me, is not the same as honoring that replaces Christ or takes the seat of his glory. This is what the world does again. Look at Luke chapter 17. I think this really puts everything in perspective with regard to this whole idea of servants. Uh, would that we could take the time or would take the time to deal with this question or uh, uh, the apostles or really uh, an, a uh, request that they made back in verse 5. They said to the Lord, increase our faith. And basically what this little teaching here is about is you don't need... An increase in your faith, if you have just the teeniest, tiniest little bit of faith, you can move mountains. He's talking about you can do great things. What you really need is obedience. That's what all of us need. We need to have a serving servant mindset that says, when I come to the Word of God, Lord, what would you have me to do? Instead of immediately putting up barricade, blockage, stops, well, this is too much, oh, I don't really want to do that, that makes me uncomfortable. Lord, what would you have me to do? And that's where, when he gets down to Luke 17, verse 10, Paul and Christ says here that we don't thank the servants in our home when they do what they're supposed to do. Because they've done what? Only what they're supposed to do. And he says in verse 10, So you too, you, me, them, when you do all things which are commanded, you say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. <laughs> Isn't that pretty simple? <clears throat> if you're obedient to Christ, who is Christ? He's your maker. He's your redeemer. He's your Lord. He's your King. As Paul would say, Christ is all. 
He's everything to us. He's our hope from sin. He is our future that we will cry out before the throne of grace. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. He is everything. So, and he, by the way, he doesn't ask us to do anything that is unreasonable. Did you know that? He doesn't ask us to do anything that's unrighteous. He doesn't ask us to do anything that's contrary to good reasoning, contrary to something good, contrary to something beneficial. He doesn't ask us to do anything evil. He works all things together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. And he calls us to be trustworthy. Now back into our text, this is what Paul is saying. That's what Apollos and Paul are. Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave, opportunity is thrown in there by the translators, gave to each one. In other words, they were vessels God used to bring these individuals to faith in Christ and to open their blind eyes to the truth. And so he goes on in verse 6 and further explains. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So here is the faithfulness of Paul planting. And he means by that that, of course, that he is preaching the gospel of truth. And along comes Apollos, and he is working among those that have now received the gospel of truth, that there might be growth in Christ. But guess what? According to what has been said so far, there's very little, if any, growth at all that is demonstrated. And why is that? Well, he goes on to say, but God was causing the growth. You realize that, that, the, um, that you and I can talk about Christ till we're blue in the face. And if my face is turning blue, you know what I mean by that. We can preach the word. We can try to teach. We can plead with individuals. We can do every kind of reasoning and gymnastics in the word of God because it is reasonable. It's the only thing that makes any sense for life for hope. It's the truth. But I can't make you believe it. I can't make you take it in. I can't make you want it, desire it, receive it. And that's why the scripture says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Because he goes on to say here, but God was causing the growth. You know, some people actually believe and they form their theology around that. If we can just get enough convincing going on, if we can just get our steps correct, step one through eight, and you follow these steps, here's your prescription to know God, we can make a person born again. No, we can't. How many of you can make a flower grow. No, we say, well, I put the seed in the ground. That's Paul planting, and maybe you watered also, so now you're Apollos. But guess who caused the growth? We don't even know what that is. You realize that? We don't know what life is. I mean, we, can, we, can, we can look at the scientific analysis of all the things that are taking place, but we can't reproduce that in a laboratory. We can't do it. And if we can't do that which is physical in life, how on earth can we do that which is spiritual? And what he's making here as an argument is, here is 
individuals puffing up men and wanting to always puff up men, which is what the natural man wants to do, when who is really important here? God is, because he's causing the growth. Do you see that? Just as God is the author of all plant life, he is the author of every truly saved person. I and you are merely servants. We're doing nothing more than pointing people to him who can save, who can grow. And this is why we pray. This is why we pray for the lost. This is why we pray for our families. This is why we pray for our neighbors and pray for one another. Because we recognize that the source of the work is the Holy Spirit of God. It's not you and me. We can have all the best intentions in the world. And so Paul will go on to say here in verse 7, under what I've called sola de gloria. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now the one who plants and the one who waters is not who we focus on, is it? That's pretty ridiculous when you sit down and think about it. They're not anything it's by comparison to the exclusive glorious work of God, which it is His work that causes the growth. And here he says, is anything. Now this means anything in relation to producing spiritual life. And I want to just remind you that you and I only have relevance in our, because of our relationship to Christ. If there is no relationship to Christ, you and I have no relevance. Remember last week we talked about, we looked at John 15, where Christ said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he talked about that, that you should be bearing fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit, what does he do? He prunes those branches away, puts them in a pile, they dry up, and he casts them into the fire. They are worthless, in other words, if there is not the work of God producing fruit through them. If they're not connected to the life of God and bearing the fruit as servants of the living God. You see, God must be working through us. You see that? You know, a little bit later on here in 1 Corinthians, well, I'll turn there. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul makes the same point talking to these same folks when he talks about love and the importance of love. And we've talked many times about love. Love is that which is the hallmark, the mark, and Christ said that himself, the great commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. It's the transforming element that shows us to be like God himself. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul's talking about all forms of religion here. He says, if you speak with the tongues of men and angels but do not have love, what do you do? Just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And he talks about the gift of prophecy and knowing all mysteries and all knowledge and having all faith, even faith, to remove mountains. But do not have love. I am just a little bit better than somebody else. No, he says, you are nothing. Zero. You haven't even gotten to first base. You struck out. Love is an absolute essential. That's why John talks about that in his epistle where he is measuring who is of God and who is not of God. He says, we love, talking about the saints, because he first loved us. Meaning by that, that the fact of love in the heart is because 
God placed His love on us first, and therefore we now love. Or in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, it talks about Paul and that great theology talks about the fact that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. It's not something we can drum up. In other words, but it comes from and is a mark of true conversion. It is an essential. And of course, none of us love the way we should love. It's not perfect, but we do love. And so what were these Corinthians demonstrating? Love? No. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. Who <laughs> on you? Who <laughs> on you? Who <laughs> on you? Quarreling among themselves about pathetically ridiculous and silly things. And so that's why Paul would say here, is anything, is anything. You know, in other words, there's no value in that kind of thinking, in that kind of reasoning, in that kind of, quote, relationship which doesn't appear to exist. You see, our value only really arrives when we are recognized and truly recognized as those for whom Christ died. Now there's a value. The Son of God died for me? There's something to drink in. Is there anything then more valuable than that? This is a strange thing, is it not? Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Though God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And then go down to verse 31. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who glory, glory in the Lord. I can't even begin to, when I'm talking about is anything, is anything relative to what I represent in, in real value apart from Christ. But in Christ, I am something. Well, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to be something. How's that? Look at 1 John chapter 3. Very familiar passage. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Have you ever thought about it in this way? Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. That's the glorification that God has promised that will take place. And so right now, in my flesh, in my simple self, uh, what am I? I'm not worth anything. I'm, I have no value except as I am in Christ Jesus, except as I am His servant, except as I am yielded, if for lack of a better term, unto Him in all areas of my life. And ultimately, it is His work, and He's going to glorify me. Him that began a good work, will He not complete it until the day of Jesus Christ? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He will. I'm going to be like Christ. That doesn't mean I'm going to be God. It means that I'm going to be righteous and holy and pure, dressed in white garments before Him. That's the picture that is given in the book of the Revelation. Hallelujah. But right now, the only way that by any means can I be thought of as having any value whatsoever. And that is by argument relative to a servant that is only to be appreciated and not elevated is in my faithfulness to him. Is in my faithfulness to him. Now, it is God, you see, who causes the growth. And so all of the glory, sola de gloria, belongs to him. 
And as you and I begin to think in some kind of way, I don't care whether it's theological or whether it's uh, uh, through some other person or some other kind of theology or thinking, and even in the decisions that we make each and every day as we're making multitudes of decisions, we need to be making our decisions to please Him, to be Christ-like, not to puff ourselves up, not to feel good, not to put a feather in our hat, Would you look with me at Acts chapter 12? God has given us an example of somebody that was puffed up. And boy, they're everywhere because all of the natural people are puffed up. And I'm afraid too often Christians find themselves in the same thing. Here is Herod. This is Herod Agrippa, not Herod the Great. But Herod Agrippa... And it says, on an appointed day, in verse 21 of chapter 12 of Acts, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. And the people kept crying out, The voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. Boy, there's a, there's a powerful example. Here's a man who had, had it made, so to speak, in the world, the leader, the, the king, the, the powerful figure in the land. And what did he do? He glorified himself. But that's the, really the picture. I don't care what level we are of every natural man. And what's the outcome? Eaten by worms and died. That's only the beginning. I could say this about Herod Agrippa. Unless God was somehow or another saved him at the last hour, and there's no indication of that, he's being eaten by worms today. The worm dieth not. He is in eternal hell fire and will be forever and ever because he did not give God the glory. Look over a few pages at Acts 14. Look at verse 10. Here is... Here is... Uh, uh, Paul, and he uh, says to a man uh, that is crippled, well, I mean, I'm trying to find a place to jump in here. Let's just back up to verse 8. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb. He had never walked. Here is a lame man from birth. The man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and seen that he had faith to be made well. And so he said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and he leaped up and began to walk. And when the crowds saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they be began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker, and so forth and so on. What was Paul and Barnabas' attitude? Boy, isn't this great, Barnabas? Look at this. These people think we're gods. Isn't this great? Why, we can do anything we want here. We can get anything we want from them. And don't you feel good about being puffed up? Don't you feel good about having this feather in your hat? Why, surely God wants us to prosper. This is great. See what God has done through us. My. No. Oh. Verse 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. He goes on to say down in verse 17, we're just witnesses. We don't have any power. We are nothing. It's all of Christ. It's all of God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Worship Him. Worship Him. There's the difference. Now, are you troubled, really troubled, when 
God doesn't receive his honor. That's everywhere around us. That's our society. That's what it's made up of today. Does that trouble you? And, and you bring it down to a personal, close level. Are you concerned to get personal honor for that which really belongs to God alone, theologically or any other way? Do you realize that your life belongs exclusively to him and not to you? We talked about that this morning again in Sunday school. That's what Christ meant when he said, take up your cross and follow me. You're servants. I'm servant. I'm not here for me. I forget that a lot, by the way. And you're not here for you. We're here for him. Now, he gives us a lot of blessings. And I'm not trying to say we should despise his blessings. But the word of God teaches us how we are to react and act and what we're supposed to do with the blessings he gives, how we're supposed to love, how we're supposed to promote him, how we're supposed to spend our priorities, our lives in relation to him as servants. And so he goes on to deal finally in verses 8 and 9 with what I believe is spiritual design. And sometimes we need to be reminded of this very thing. This is what I would call the big picture. All of us are in Christ and in this big picture. We have a place or a fit. Uh, uh, you're unique. I'm unique. We are not all the same. We're not cookie cutter robots. We are people that each have a particular calling for God as his servant, if you're in him. Because God has a perfect plan and design. You see, what is really going on in the world? I've said this many times, and, and think about this. As you watch Fox News and all these other things, if you watch Fox News, or CNN, or whatever you watch, you know, I think, well, never mind, I'm not going to get into that. But as you're looking at that, you're not really seeing, you're seeing all the things that are going on, the elements of things that are going on. But what's really going on behind the scene is what God is doing. And God is dealing with that too, but that's the, the world in which we live in. And what we're seeing is the chaos because of the sin and the mess that man makes out of everything and everywhere he turns. But behind the scenes, what's really important is what Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He is building his church. If we looked and studied in detail Ephesians chapter 1 and you see God in that, he's building his church, he's putting it together. And if you're in Christ, you're part of that church. Right now, today, and I would remind you that the reason that Christ hasn't returned is what 2 Peter chapter 3 says. He's not willing that any should perish. And I believe that any there is talking about the elect. He hasn't saved the last person he's going to save. And until he saves the last person he's going to save, he's not coming back. That's why he's delayed his coming. Or we could look at Romans chapter 11 in verses 25 to 27 where he talks about the fullness of the Gentiles, the church, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, until the last Gentile, the last one in the church age is saved. And then all Israel is, God's going to turn his focus upon Israel and pour out his spirit upon them as he has promised all through the Old Testament. And he's going to save them. That's the big picture. But right now, we're in the middle of this picture in our own little realm as servants and the point is that we're not to be man-centered it's not about our rights our comforts or our personal objectives it's not a club but it's about finding our place of living out our faith God-centered obedience to his great plan and this is what Paul will emphasize here. So, 
He says, first of all, we're separate but unified. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? He says we're individuals. Look at that. Now he who plants and he who, he who waters, excuse me, are one. Now the one who plants is separate than the one who waters. They're both doing their thing with their gifts and their timing and their way. It's God's truth. The truth doesn't vary. But the servant is. But he says they are one. They are one. You know, this was the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 17. We don't take the time to look there. But they might be one, even as we are one, talking to his Father. Can you imagine that? And do you realize that what brings unity is not us all getting together and having a pep rally and saying, let's be unified, let's be unified, let's be unified, and giving up our thoughts on theology, our thoughts on this, or our thoughts on that, our attitudes about this or that or anything else, and just trying to get in a big puddle. That's not going to make us unified. What makes us unified is studying and knowing Jesus Christ. We come together in Him. We take on His mind. We have the mind of Christ. And when we do that, we can fit on the head of a pen. That's real unity because we have the mind and heart of Christ. And you see, that's where what Paul is saying here. Paul and Apollos are not divided, and he goes on to say, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. There's the separation again. Just as each one of us must give a personal account before God, if we are in Christ, we will be righteously evaluated by Christ himself for our faithfulness that we looked at earlier during our time that he gave us on the earth. Does that make you sober this morning? You're being evaluated by the true and the living God. That ought to make us real sober. Now, I'm not saying that to, uh, we're not talking about heaven and hell here, but we are talking about being pleasing to him. And there's a lot of other issues that could be uh, brought in to bear on that. But this should be sobering to each one of us. In verse 9, he says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Notice that little phrase, fellow workers. Fellow, a, a type of special unity. We're, we're working together with the same goal in mind. That goal is that Christ came to seek and save that which is lost. We are together in this to build the kingdom of Christ. If we took the time to go back to Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 13, where he talks about he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the building up of the faith, so that we all come to the place of maturity and unity in Christ's likeness. That's the Jim Bryant paraphrase. It's a huge issue. And he says here that we are God's fellow workers in this, and you are God's field. And that means the Corinthian church, but it applies to us at GBC as well. You are God's field. I am God's field. Uh, and, and let me just say that you are both the workers in the field and you are the field. <laughs> Isn't that something? And the whole business here is Christ's business. I'm going to get you to look at two places and we'll quickly cl close here. Look at Acts chapter 1. Being in Israel just a short time ago, so reminded of this happened right out there on that Mount of Olives. Here, here they are after the resurrection and the, the disciples are around Christ on the Mount of Olives and he says, so when they had come together, verse 6, 
They were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. They couldn't have. You think if Christ had said, would well, we know it's not going to be for thousands of years. <laughs> they couldn't have withstood that. It's good that we don't know. Isn't that amazing? That, that, and that's not the issue when he comes. Now, I think we're getting real close, personally. But it's not for you to know the times or epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power and the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. There's where we still are. We are his witnesses. We are his servants. We are to serve him. We are to be about his business. And look one final place, which really has to do with the same thinking of how we're to be conducting ourselves while he is yet coming, and he is coming again. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'll just read this, and with this we'll close. This is serving Christ. Someone says, well, what's the will of God for me? Well, here it is. He told these Thessalonians. He says in verse 11, he's closing out this letter, chapter 5, verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Now, I didn't put that in there so that y'all will all uh, hug up on me. That's nice. I love you to hug up on me. But it is appropriate, and I do the same thing with you. You're edifying me. I hope I'm edifying you. We edify one another. We're building up one another. We're encouraging one another. Uh, were the Corinthians doing that? No. Walking around selfishly puffed up and despising this person because they didn't quite fit what they thought was most important in their own little minds or whatever. Looking at people. But let's encourage one another. What are we encouraging one another to do? To be more like Christ to walk and fight the good fight of faith, to live as Christ would have you to live, to take comfort and joy in the things of God. That's really appreciating one another. He says, we urge you, brethren, and admonish the unruly. Somebody gets out of line. We go in love to them. We encourage the faint-hearted. We help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek that which is good for one another and for all people. Wow. My, how they love one another. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Don't sin. Don't stifle the Spirit of God that is guiding and directing in your life. Do not despise prophetic utterances, the truth, but examine everything. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. That puts everything in perspective. Everything in perspective. We cannot make saints, but we know him who can. And we can be servants, and it is to be found of servants, stewards, that one be made or found faithful. We are workers in his field until he returns. Let me pray for us. Father, help us. Help us to do that which we cannot do of ourselves. 
Take away our selfishness. Take away our foolishness. Oh, Father, show us Christ. And make us servants to please Him in every way. Forgive us where we fail you in this. Make this church a beacon of light relative to service to Thee. We ask this in Jesus' name.